Personally, I wanted to recognize John Crawford's contribution to CGIR, to uh, International Food Policy Research Institute. So John Crawford was a diplomat, and he's also a good economist. My institute was established in 1975, so right after the first food price crisis. So John was very instrumental in setting up my institute in responding to that food price crisis. And his argument was, Technology is great, technology is very important, but policy is equally important. So that's why IPRI was set up. And we really attribute to John Crawford for, for his contribution. And obviously, he served as IPRI's first board chair. And in the last four decades, we have had four Australian board chairs. So John Crawford. Jeff Miller, your former secretary or former minister of agriculture. Uh, Ross Garnett, yeah, um, I think you advised your prime minister in making lots of policy changes where the Australian economy began to take off. Then another distinguished economist, Kim Anderson. So Kim Anderson will become IPRI's board chair in January 2014. I think many of you probably know him, actually. He strongly recommended me to come here to give a talk. Now, what I will do is just go through some slides, maybe next uh, 30 minutes, and I will be happy to answer some of the questions. I think I'm always interested in the Q&A Q sessions. I apologize that my slide has been split into two pieces. So you have to look at uh, my title at the bottom here. <laughs> um, so some technical issues. But I don't think you will miss much. The majority of my content will be uh, at the probably 75 bottom part of my, my slide. So we are facing some challenges right now. Eight, 850 million people are still suffering from hunger and malnutrition. Water energy scarcity threaten food security. And to produce more food, we also need water and energy, so that sort of interface is important. And sustainable intensification is essential to meet agricultural and food requirements. So sustainable intensification, I will come back to explain what does sustainable intensification mean. And Nexus approach should be adopted to achieve sustainable food security. So Nexus approach. So 850 million people are suffering from hunger and malnutrition. In 2000, the global leaders and the national leaders came together and committed themselves to cut the percentage of undernourishment by half. That is probably from, let's say, from 20, uh, 24% to 13%. Sorry, actually 18%, 18% to 9%. But today, the percentage is about 13%. So we are still far away from meeting that goal, called the MDG goal, to cutting the percentage of undernourishment by half. Yes, we made some progress, particularly here in Asia, in Southeast Asia, in East Asia. So the undernourishment, undernourishment has been cut dramatically through agricultural growth, through social protection, through many other means. But in South Asia and Africa, the percentage remain very high. And there is another hunger called hidden hunger that you cannot observe. The lack of micronutrients, lack of vitamins, and the damage to mental, physical health, is equally, important, uh, equally, uh, equally uh, important, if not more. Right now, about 2 billion people are suffering from that. And every year, because of the undernourishment or lack of micronutrients, we lose 2 to 3% of global GDP. Children's undernutrition is particularly dam damaging. So when a child is undernourished, is either too short compared to his height, called under, underweight, 
or he's too short compared to his age, stunting. But stunting is a good indicator because, because it measures the undernutrition, malnutrition in long term, the so chronic hunger, chronic malnutrition issues. But look at that figure. In many parts of the world, 20%, 25%, or even 40% of children are stunt. So when the children are stunt, their mental, physical, the cognitive capability or also IQ will, will be compromised. So their school grades will be lower, and their productivity will be lower, the wages will be lower, the income earned will be much lower. And there's another dimension of malnutrition. It's the third burden that is overweight and obesity. We have 2.1 billion, the equivalent to the people who are hungry, who are either overweight or obese. It's not just a developing country phenomena. In developing countries, obesity, overweight are equally significant. And the rate of increase in developing countries is actually faster than some of the rich countries. So actually 62% of obese and overweight population is in developing countries. Here in Oceania, 40% of men, 50% of women are overweight. Probably most significant, significant is the rapid increase of children overweight and obesity. And probably you have seen that, and lots of fat children in big urban centers, including my own country, China. If you go to Shanghai, Beijing, you will see probably 20%, if not more, children are overweight, obese. So water energy scarcity increasingly threaten food, security, and nutrition. So here I wanted to emphasize nutrition. So it's not just the food. It's what type of food, whether the food is nutritious enough to meet your body's need. So all these are linked, so water, energy, and food. I just wanted to give you a two very good example how these three things link together uh, during lunch. You know, so I have a dialogue with uh, Quentin. Biofuel is a very typical case, biofuel. Biofuel makes food, water, and energy link together. So that's why we need to work on these issues in one piece. So biofuel production, increases global food prices, threatens everybody's food security. Biofuel production also uses enough water in Nebraska because of the increased corn production. The underground water, the reservoir, has been de depleting very fast. And we have seen the increased, increased correlation between oil price and energy price. You know, the energy, pr energy price is much more volatile than oil price, at least in the last four decades. But recently, that correlation has even has, has further increased. The correlation between food and energy prices have doubled. Why? The corporate is biofuel. So when the oil price reaches to $90 per barrel, the biofuel production will become economically viable, even without any sub subsidies. And not mentioning today, biofuel production are subsidized. So even without subsidies. So that's a perfect case. Food, water, energy are linked together. There's another case that is large-scale hydronic dams. Yes, from the posit posit positive perspective, these dams can generate electricity to help you to increase access to energy, particularly poor people. It also helps to irrigate land to produce more food. It uses water, right? So water, energy, and um, food together. But the question is the environmental impact, long-term impact. Can we have win, win, win in terms of energy, water, and food by building these large-scale dams? And well, we are facing some challenges. Okay, the first challenge of is increasing population urbanization. So that will demand more water, more energy, more food. Rising incomes and demand 
the diet changes. Same. So when the people are moving to the cities, they demand more food, better food. They also demand more water. They use more electricity. And the rising energy prices, biofuel expansions, as, as I have said, these linkages have become much stronger after 2007-2008 food crisis. Then growing land and water constraints as a result of population growth, as a result of urbanization, and probably as a result of climate change. So climate change has net the loss of fertile land in many countries, particularly in poor countries. So poor countries will suffer more than anybody else when the climate change hit them. Soil, temperature, the rainfall. And then let me just review how agriculture actually affects water and energy. So agriculture consumes 70% of fresh water sources. And global water withdrawals to rise 50% by 2050. So we need more water to produce more food. And most of the growth is actually in some of the emerging economies, BRICS, some in your neighbor, China, Indonesia, India. And right now, 15 to 30 5% of global irrigation withdrawals are not sustainable. So we cannot continue to deplete our underground water, or we cannot continue to use the fresh water to irrigate more land. And the shifting diets will affect water consumption. So food waste, obesity, overeating of meat, not only increases food prices, it actually creates huge pressure on water. So one kg, one, can, one kg of beef needs seven times, ten times water than one kg of grains or vegetables. So agriculture is both vulnerable and a contributor to water scarcity. So I have been working on agriculture for the last three decades. So I have to recognize agriculture is part of the problem. Now look at the water stress in many different parts of the uh, world. And indeed, it is, it is in some of the poorest country, poorest regions, where the water scarcity will be the most severe. And they do not have economic means, they do not have technologies to address the stresses. And by 2050, if we don't do something, you know, business as usual, 52% of the global population will live in water scarce region. So right now it's about 35. And 45% of global GDP will come from water scarce region. And half of the grain production will come from water scarce region. What does that mean? If, if the grains come from water scarce region, that means they are more vulnerable because the rainfall fluctuates. So more volatile in our global food system. And energy. Energy demand you know, will increase by 30% from now to um, 2035, the next two decades or so. <clears throat> and the rising energy prices make biofuel more profitable, promoting food fuel competition, as I have already said. So biofuel production to increase by 50% by 2020. So in the next uh, 10 years, we will see the, the biofuel production by increase, by increase by 50%. By 2050, probably will double. What does that mean? So more land will be used for biofuel production. More food will be converted to biofuel, biofuels. So that creates tremendous pressure on global food security. <clears throat> and obviously, increased cost of agriculture production because increased energy prices, increased water prices, or increased water shortage. And Rural neighbors are moving to the cities, so wages are increasing. How can we feed 9.5 or even 9.6 billion people? And then this morning when we were in the parliament, we heard from a UN official, UN Population Funds, saying that by 2050, we will have 9.6 billion people in this world. 600 million people then, I thought, I thought a 9 billion is, is, is a number ever recorded, but he said 9.6. So that further, further 
increase the stress on our global food system. And then for poor people, in fact, all these three things are, are correlated. So it is poor who do not have access to energy. It is poor who do not have access to good, clean drinking water sanitation. It is poor people who do not have access to good food. So it's a bad nexus for poor people. So the good nexus are we have good access to water, energy, and food. But the poor do not. Many poor do not have that. And sustainable intensification is essential to meet agriculture and food requirements. So sustainable in intensification means we produce more with less. And here more is not just more grains, more output. It's more nutrition, nutrients. Mass means mass water, mass energy, and a mass carbon emission. So that is our goal. How can we produce more, more nutrition with less, less water, less energy, less carbon emission. And there are many quick wins. Policy failed. For example, subsidies in water, subsidies in energy, subsidies in fertilizers. That actually exacerbated overuse of water, energy, and to some extent, <clears throat> and also nutrients or micronutrients on the ground. Um, so we can remove off some of these subsidies. And technology you know, innovations, I'll come back to this. And so at APRI, we try to analyze how sustainable intensification can help to produce more with less. The global model, called the impact model, that covers many countries, majority of the producers, consumers of major food crops, so 40 um, 115 countries, 40 major agriculture commodities, and link each country to the rest of the world through trade. So trade is a way to solve the global equation, supply equals demand plus stock. And the price, obviously, is also um, a, a variable that determines the trade. So here we try to analyze different options or different scenarios. So how different scenarios would affect the future food supply and demand through sustainable intensification. And we have made some assumptions. I know here many of you are researchers, are scholars. So that's why I wanted to explain a bit detail. So for example, high economic growth, low population growth, this is our assumption. So 3.6% economic growth, 0.35% population growth. These are the assumptions, and these assumptions can easily be violated if some policy changes to push up population growth or to slow down economic growth. Then um, additional investments in agriculture research. Yes, we know that we need more investment, so we made some assumption. So crop yield growth, so 90% from the baseline that so we I think by 2050, the crop yield will increase by 90%. So livestock yield will increase by 50%. Water use efficiency improvements by 2050, so 1.2% per year. Um, technical change in domestic and industrial sectors, for access to safe drinking water. So these are the assumptions related to water. And a reduction in water demand, domestic by 0.45%. Industrial by 0.43%, irrigation by 14.5%. So all these are the basic assumptions in our model. The climate change. Climate change is a very wild card. We assume two degree increase uh, from now to 2050. Access to secondary schools for all girls by 2030. So we did a simulation to look at the, oh, okay, looks like this part. So the title is at the bottom. Uh, the left side is, and then you have to use your imagination. <laughs> so we did a sort of different uh, type of uh, simulations. These are the different scenarios, you know, all kinds of different uh, sustainable uh, intensification practices. Then look at uh, the impact on um, 
let's say, impact on grain production. Sorry, here actually it's a, a grain production. Uh, here's area harvested. Uh, here is probably the calorie. And here is the children, number of children. So the sustainable in intensification is alternative, is a scenario, not, a not the baseline. And then we look at uh, the results or impact on these different indicators. Um, so the first row actually is the price. I think it's the grain price, the grain price. So from, let's say, okay, the conventional world means business as usual. The food price will increase from 200 tons, or uh, $200 per ton, 250. It's a real price uh, based in probably 1995. So the actual price, it will be much higher. However, if we, uh, if we adopt sustainable approach, sustain, sustainable intensification, food price will actually go down, go down from 160, sorry, from let's say, yeah, from 150 in 2005 to 600, 160 in 2030, and come down to 154 in 2050. So global food price will be more and less stable if we pursue a more sustainable intensification. And the crop areas, if we pursue a more sustainable intensification, the areas required to produce food actually will go down. What does that mean? That means we will have land for environmental purposes, environmental services, so people can use them as entertainment or recreational purpose. Then obviously the calorie, here's a calorie per day, uh, per person will be increased substantially under the sustainable intensification scenarios. Obviously, we don't, do not expect everybody will consume more than 4,000 calories per day. Yeah. Um, then, more interestingly, is to look at the impact of undernourished children. So business as usual, we will still have more than 100 million children who will suffer from malnourishment or malnutrition, business as usual. From, from current 150. So on a sustainable intensification, that number will be reduced to 50. Yes, we still have a, quite a number of undernourished children by 2050, even we pursue a more sustainable intensification. So that's why other approaches, other mechanisms should also be used. So not just from production side, you know, social protection, and cash transfer to help the poor to access to food. And again, the climate change will change the world, will change the agriculture, will change the food system. So there are many practices that can pursue a win-win-win sort of opportunities. The, win, the first win is to increase productivity. The second win is to increase resilience or increase farmers' income. The third is to help them to mitigate the climate change. So adaptation, mitigation, and in the meantime, help the poor to exit from poverty. So there, there are many, many practices. For example, newer crop varieties from CGIR, C4 rice. So newer type of rice will be able to produce more, 25% more yield, will use more ener uh, less energy, 20% less energy, 20% less carbon emission. So these new technologies can do a lot. Now, obviously, when productivity improved, farmers will gain. So adaptation, mitigation, and a farmer's income. Again, here, the rotation among crops, fallows, help to conserve the land, water, cover crops, tree cover crops. Some, you, know, you plant some trees along your crop that can provide a shared for your crops, and the appropriate use of fertilizers and the manure. Particularly newer technology, newer fertilizers should release the nutrients to crops slowly, more efficiently. Right now, many countries overuse fertilizers. That's because these fertilizers are not very efficient. China and India waste 40% of their fertilizers. All these nutrients have been washed away. So an access approach should be adopted to achieve, achieve sustainable intensification, so instead of sign -off. So look at the, again, I apologize, you know, this next part has been chopped. 
water, energy, and food. So along each node here, water, energy, and food, they can do something uh, along their own work, but in the meantime, more important is interfaces among the three sectors. So the Nexus approach will be able to minimize the trade-offs and promote sector synergies. We know that there are trade-offs. If, if you want to put, wanted to produce more, then obviously you have to use water and energy. You will, you will have more carbon emission, right? It's a trade-off. But there are also synergies, win-win-win, as I already presented requires greater levels of collaboration among actors from each sector. As Quentin has said, right now we are still working in silos. Everybody is working in their small corners in their office, working on either food, water, or energy. So we needed to collaborate, we needed to work together. Individuals, but also institutions, countries, promote connective policy design, implementation, and monitoring. So some of the, okay, the on energy issues, the impact of energy, groundwater, nexus, just to give you some examples. So energy subsidies matter to agricultural growth, but water depletion, as I already said, we need to cut down energy subsidy and also make sure that free electricity in some of the farming areas, some of the farming countries needs to be stopped, particularly in Punjab, Haryana, many parts of India. And obviously, overuse of energy reduce access to rural poor, lack of nexus approach. Um, so we are needed to lose, lose, lose. Why lose, lose, lose? If you provide free electricity, farmers actually do not have incentive to save. They just leave their tuber wells on because electricity is not reliable, it's public goods. And gov why government has no money to pay for more electricity uh, production so then, when the electricity comes in the evening, in the evening people actually don't use much electricity, and water begins to come. They leave the tube wells on, and then the whole field is flooded. So waste of water, waste of energy, and obviously the crop production has also been compromised. And we'll increase investment in agricultural research and extension services that promotes resource efficient inputs and practices, close yield gaps. So there are still a lot of yield gaps among different countries, even within the same country. Access to improved crop varieties, particularly the sort of win-win-win crop varieties. Access to effective input-output markets. It is still the case that many smallholders do not have access to input and output markets. The best way to improve their nutrition, their diet quality, is actually through market. So if they can produce more, they sell some of their produce and then buy from the market. And the adoption of sustainable land management practices. So again, sometimes it's a poor who contributes to the degradation of natural resources. Poor do not have access to clean energy. They go to the hills, mountains, cut down the woods and bring them back as cooking, cooking fuels that are not only affect the environment, it also affects the health. This indoor smoking every year kills more than 3 million people. Improve water use efficiency, so you know, improve water transportation, irrigation efficiency by improving the whole irrigation uh, infrastructure. Shift from irrigation agriculture in water scarce areas to uh, water rich areas, shift from irrigated to ram fed crops. Again, research can play a very big role there to introduce crops into rain-fed areas. So the crops actually don't need much water, and, and they still can produce a very good, good yield. And agriculture technologies that produce more with less. And again, here at APRI, we did a study to quantify the impact of 11 technologies, how this 11 technologies can produce more with less. I think we have a brochure somewhere there, right, to illustrate to you how these different technologies can help. And develop a strong institution which support resource rights. It's still the case that water is free and land is not protected. So when something is free, 
when something is not reflected in its scarcity, the prices, then the people will have no incentives to protect them. Who would protect something that does not belong to me? So this is one of the core major causes of inefficiency. And we'll employ physical policy that promotes sustainable, healthy and diets. As I said, overweight and obesity contributes to health problem. Every year, three million people die because of obesity. Every year, we lose 2% of GDP because of obesity and overweight. How can we help the population, general citizens, to promote a more sustainable diet? So the diet is nutritious, healthy, not eat too much, but in the meantime, <laughs> helps to save water, energy, and helps to push down the food prices. Obviously, market, getting the price right is also very important. Why there's huge food waste? It's because food is too cheap for many people. When food is cheap, then you waste it. Now, address food loss and waste. Now, this is a huge issue. In development countries, the food waste happens usually in retailing sector, in your dining table, or you, in your refrigerators. For developing countries, it's, it's the technologies, it's a pest disease in the field, as opposed to harvesting technologies, it's a transportation. So, although the same issue, the waste and the loss, but it happens for different reasons and in different stages of production system. So we need to address them separately, differently. And for biofuel production, this is, this is a big issue uh, right now. How can we really introduce some of the innovations to look at the, the second generation of biotechnology that does not use food grains? For example, the, yesterday I heard a presentation from my colleague from ICRISET, International Center for Dry or Semi-Dry Areas. So they introduced a sweet sorghum crop, sweet sorghum. The sweet sorghum can help provide food to poor people. The sorghum is actually more nutritious than rice and wheat. You might know that. And the straws or stems can be used to feed animals. And the straws can also be converted to biofuels. This is another great win-win-win. But this investment in science and technology will be critical. So these are some of my summaries. So one is well, a, next, a next approach is critical to end hunger and malnutrition. Sustainable intensification creates more with less. And finally, policy coherence is needed to account for interdependencies across sectors. So technology is important. Policy is equally important, if not more important. Thank you. So I'll be happy to answer some of the questions. Number two. Um, my question is how much of a public investment is going to be needed to bring about these changes? So is it, is it a question of resources or is it a question of just changing, changing policies? Do you want to be... Yeah, I think there are not quick wins. You don't need to have a huge investment. It's our behavior change. You know, when I do agriculture, should I think about uh, water? Should I think about energy? Should I think about environment? So that sort of thinking, I don't know, does thinking cost anything? Probably not much. <laughs> some you probably you will have some brain cells that probably I think probably further stimulate it, not really die. <laughs> yes, investment is needed for a couple of strategic areas. One is education. I think right now the students are still educated in silos. Oh your agriculture, your food, your environment, or your water. I think if we can have a master degree program to bring all this together, nutrition, food, energy, environment, water, why not? Can we start from education? Then if the, let's say, DFAT wants to invest, I think this is a great area to invest. Master degree, I don't know whether you need a PhD, which is probably even more silent. <laughs> And then some partnership, create some partnership, create an environment, 
for the people to interact, to work together. At IPRI, we also have nutritionists, economists, engineers, uh, macroeconomists. For even until four or five years ago, they just sit in their little corner to do their own research. So what we did is we created a cafeteria. Well, we have teas, coffee together. Just that small thing encouraged the researchers to exchange the ideas, how they can work together, to make sure that their work do not have cross purposes. So what I'm working with actually does not compromise your, your objectives. So a lot of simple things can do, can have quick wins. But in longer run, yes, we need to change the governance. At global level, we have some, some global sort of uh, organization working on water. We also have FAO working on food and agriculture. We have IFAT working on smallholders productivity. So can we combine them together? Energy is another big issue. They never care about energy. Carbon emission. So global level governance needs to be changed to make sure that they do work together. They do, let's say, develop sort of integrated program. And government, national government. Yeah, you still have Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Climate Change. Do we have a mechanism to bring them together, either in the Prime Minister's, Prime Minister's office or somewhere? So we needed to make some institutional changes as well. I don't know whether this will cost money. We need any investment. Probably some is important, but more important is to change our behavior, change the way we work together. Thank you very much, Dr. Fan, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Paul Burlow. I'm a PhD student from Crawford School. Uh, I had a question about policy responses to nexus issues. Um, so, dominant policy responses to scarcity in, in water, food, energy in this country and elsewhere often focus on supply side solutions. So, more dams, uh, more desalination mm -hmm. plants, land clearing. But, as an economist, it seems natural that demand side solutions and policies like removing efficient subsidies, as you mentioned, and, and appropriate pricing of these resources um, is much more efficient. But on the other hand, it's very difficult. They can be very difficult to implement because of resistance from industry or also effects on the general population. So my question is, what do you feel are the most important um, barriers for policymakers in terms of implementing demand-side solutions? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. You know, how can we create a political wills for politicians to make some change? I think politicians respond to general citizens. I think if we can empower our citizens with knowledge information, say, hey, business as usual is not acceptable. We only have one planet. If we do the business as usual, by 2050, we need another two planets, right? That's what I heard yesterday. But we don't have one. We can't move to Mars, we cannot move to the moon, obviously. So the politician usually is driven by general citizens. I think if the citizens are empowered with this knowledge information, then they will push their political system. That's a lesson we learned. We used to communicate this to uh, the policymakers, politicians in India, China. They said, so what? I care about my, my party. I care about my sort of political legitimacy because I respond to my political constituents. So until we change political constituents, I'm afraid this existing govern, governance structure will not be changed. Maybe that's a good thesis topic. How can you empower the general citizen to work up to change the political system? Uh, there's one from Somebody is serving the country, I guess. <laughs> it's from, uh, Liz Bolton, also doing a PhD at Fenner School. Right? All right. Environment and Society. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, when, when you're talking about the nexus between um, food, water, and security, I've you know, just been looking lately at behaviour change, and they're saying that most of this book, when you really get down to people's cognitive and their neural pathways, is their very, very deep beliefs, and that 98% you know, of the brain is um, our reasoning is done in our unconscious. Um, so, I was just wondering if these research programs would have involved potentially artists and people who are good at narratives who, mm. who can help um, actually access those deeper parts of people's brains to do the behaviour change, the new framing and things that's required to make these yeah. um, ideas a reality. Yeah, I think it's a good question. 
Um, if some years ago, we tried to communicate some of the extension knowledge information to farmers. Yes, we use cultural events, dancing, singing, all kinds of performance to influence the local, particularly women farmers, right? They are not more acceptive to this sort of thing. Yeah, I think it actually worked very well. But now, how can we change the people's behavior, thinking fundamentally? It's a very much a research topic. So at IPRI, International Food Policy Research Institute, our nutrition division is looking at that issue. Why good nutrition has not been practiced either by poor or very rich people who overcome, overconsume. So through different ways, through, through um, campaigns, through knowledge, through um, all kinds of different modern medias. So it's still a work in progress. I really hope that maybe in a year or two, we can report some results. That's it, Professor. Thank you for the presentation. I was wondering why should we focus only on these three aspects of the nexus and not being having a, a more integrated uh, vision of the of the system involving health, involving transportation. Why should we focus only on energy, water, and food? Well, to me, the transportation is an instrument, not the really uh, one of the goals, right? You can integrate many other things, right? If you want me to add a couple of, let's say, Nexus note there, the first one I wanted to add is actually nutrition. Nutrition. The other one is probably carbon emission. You know, well, water is fine, right? Water energy is fine. But carbon emission, carbon emission, nutrition probably should be added into this Nexus approach. But all others you discuss actually are the instruments, are the, the factors who can drive the interlinkages of this so-called outcome variables. Um, I have a question regarding policy coherence you mentioned earlier about at the domestic level. I'm just wondering what it is at the international level, because we all know it's true we talk about domestic politics, but we also have to adhere to what's happening in the, in the international arena. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just wondering about if there's been anything done about the policy coherence with respect to this nexus uh, at the retail level, because this, this affects the whole trade arrangements and from that the subsidies, and it somehow applies some pressure for local, for governments to do, like to, to, to take action at national level. So I was just wondering if we talk about domestic politics, but the international one, which actually limits government's ability. I'm just thinking about Australia playing to tobacco packaging and all those uh, litigations. So if you sure. think about right. it, it's perhaps at the global level would empower governments to do it at the national level? Okay. Yeah, at the global level, we are facing some challenges. One is trade, clearly trade. Trade is not still not fair, still not open, still not free, well, I'm free, maybe not the, the right word, but not, that's definitely not transparent. So I think we've, we've failed, we failed, what, um, for the last probably four or five decades. So how can we really bring all these issues to w, WTO, the multinational framework, instead of bilateral regional agreements? I think this is a key message also to Australians. Australians used to be a champion in the globalisms, WHO global framework. So don't move away from global framework to regional bilateral framework. We failed desperately in this area. That's trade issues. And obviously, there are many other issues we failed. For example, the coordination of transboundary diseases. Yes, right now, can see many diseases can still walk around, transmit across different borders. We still don't have a good mechanisms to work around that area. I just gave you some examples. There are so many examples. But at national level, I think this coherence probably is even, even more important. So for example, the agricultural ministry, its objective is to maximize the food production, self-sufficiency. Use more water, land, 
to use the trade export bans. Meantime, I'm investing in research. The Ministry of Health is focusing on fixing the health problem instead of prevention. Ministry of Environment, look at the climate change, look at the water and land issues in silos. So how can we really bring these policies together, have a coherent approach to tackle all these problems integrated in an integrated manner instead of competing with each other? And the subsidies, for example, right now most of the subsidies in agriculture goes to wheat, rice, maize production. And these are good food. I mean, in the 70s, 80s, they played a very big role in feeding the whole world. But today, is, is it still a wise policy to continue to promote rice, wheat, maize production by subsidizing them, by investing so much, even research resources into that? Can we change that a little bit towards more nutritious food, fruits, vegetables, and promote better healthy lifestyle? So we have lots of things to do to make sure that our objectives are not cross purposes. Our objectives are actually not coherent. So national level, I think probably is more important than global level. Sometimes the global level problems actually are derived from national level. Uh, my name is uh, Yun, and my question is uh, about uh, bilateral and multilateral donors and what potential role they can have in supporting this the win-win win nexus, particularly in the case of developing countries. Yeah. Well, obviously, both bilateral and multinational investment is still not enough. You know, we needed to make sure that the total investment should, should go up. And I think the global level multinational support is very critical. It's not just the funding. It's not just the money. It's more sort of policy support. It's more a willingness to work together. So let's say the WHO, FAO, the World Bank work together on the cross-cutting issues. That's a nutrition. Nutrition is everybody's work. It is also nobody's work because nobody is accountable for any nutrition outcome. So at a global level, can we make sure that WHO and or UNICEF and FAO to be accountable to be accountable for nutrition outcome? So not just a production, so not just a, a health issues, a, a doctor or training. And the bilateral funding support, yes. Don't try to support just one ministry versus another. Bring several ministries to work together. I recently involved in some of the WFP World Food Program review in some of the countries. But WFP wants to move towards more holistic approach: nutrition, smallholders' income, short-term relief for long-term development, building resilience for everybody. But when they move to the country, then you meet all these kinds of hurdles. Minister of Agriculture said, "Oh." You should work with me. Don't work with others. If you work with others, I will throw you out. Ministry of Health, they don't think the food or nutrition as an important part of instrument to improve health, environment. So all of this must work together. So your bilateral funding, I would suggest you bring the ministries together to use your money more strategically more instrumentally, instead of business as usual, you know, different ministries in silos. It's been a very uh, interesting uh, presentation and uh, your responses to the questions I've found very interesting too. I guess the, the question which I had is that uh, we've had, you said, the WTO has uh, been a, a conspicuous uh, mixed result, shall we say. Uh, climate change uh, been around now for two or three decades and very mixed progress. Millennium Development Goals, maybe we haven't made much progress, bits and pieces here and there. So at an international level, uh, uh, we've got a fair bit of work to do. If you go around uh, at the national level, around uh, both the uh, developed and developing countries, I think uh, similarly the scorecards would be uh, very mixed. 
uh, not only at individual policy levels, but at uh, trying to integrate uh, policy mm -hmm. solutions or policy <coughs> coherence, if you like. So I guess the question which I have is, uh, what what is it that's going to drive uh, some different sets of results? Why, why do we think that the world isn't just going to continue uh, and the national level, and the world level, continue in a way that we have for the last two or three decades? Why is it that uh, something might change uh, in the years ahead? Well, I don't want it to sound totally negative. Well, we have achieved some progress in the last uh, two or three decades. The MDGs, right, among eight goals, we achieved the number one. That is to uh, have the number of poor, extreme poverty by half. Yes, we, we achieved that target. Well, of course, the majority of the credits go to Asia, right? East Asia, China, Vietnam, and even hunger. You know, around 1990, we had about 800 million, maybe 900 hungry people. Today, we still have 850. Does that mean we have not made any progress? No. That's because total population increased. So we have to recognize what we have achieved and learn from it, why we succeeded in some areas. Why? I think on poverty and hunger goals and health goals, I think actually we made a progress in three goals, if I can. One is um, poverty, one is hunger, one is actually health. That's because the, the goals we set up are very measurable. Yeah, we can debate about it, measurable. Whether it's $1, $1.25, or uh, it's 180 calories per day. Clear goals, compare the progress across different countries, give the countries pressure. Oh, India, India always argue, well, why do you think my hunger level is very high? So they are very concerned about these indicators. If, you know, if they challenge your number, which means they care. So I can see that. So to have the goals, to have the measurable goals, and to monitor, check the progress is very critical. So now, when we move to the post-2015 agenda, Right now, it's, we're in the middle of the debate. Currently, there are 17 goals, 169 targets. So I'm very concerned about too many goals. Yeah, 17. Who can remember 17? I don't know. I can't. I can remember until six. After six, then I won't be able to remember. So how can we really truly, truly define, define some key goals we wanted to achieve and separate enablers Instruments from goals. I think this is very critical, particularly from DFAT. <laughs> Make sure that we support that process. Make sure that we have the right goals. There are 169 targets. Many of them are not measurable. They are aspirational. When the, goals, when the targets are not measurable, you will not be able to make the people accountable. So, that, so when we move to the post-2015 agenda, let's make sure we have clear targets, clear goals, measurable goals, we can track and monitor the progress. But more importantly, I think for SDGs to work, is to make sure the countries, countries, whether it's developed or developing countries, are falling, falling in that process until the countries, until the countries who can lead, can drive, can own their own development agenda, then you will not be able to achieve it. Again, this is a lesson we learned from MDGs. It is the countries who own, who drive, who need their program, and they succeeded. 